How's it going, folks? Uh, Chris Mohan here, uh, coming in uh, this this interim recording on June fifteenth, which is the day after the home run for Julian event in uh, in Columbus, which I was uh, very excited to to be a part of, and I, uh, I headed out to Columbus yesterday to document as much as I could, and uh, and and also also do a little 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 performance, a little stand up uh, set. Um, and, uh, which, which I did, and it was, it was very great. You guys are, uh, about to, to watch some of it, but, uh, I did, I, I kind of showed up late, uh, which I felt very, very terrible about, um, cause I missed, you know, some, some of the speakers and, uh, and all that, but, uh, I wanted to make sure that, that you guys could at least see some of the, the speeches, um, so I'm going to use snippets from uh, Facts on the Ground. Uh, Misty Winston was live streaming the event on the Facts on the Ground page, um, as well as Slow Newsday. Um, so you're gonna, you, you, I'm gonna try to grab a couple of, um, couple of minutes of each person talking, uh, and then I'll put up a, 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 a little snippet of my set as well. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, I'll kind of talk about what happened afterwards and everything. Um, and I, I wanted to document a lot more, but unfortunately I was unable to do that because, uh, I, I haven't been on the road <laughs> in over a year. And when you aren't on the road constantly, uh, you forget some of the little nuances of, uh, of, of traveling, such as the fact that Ohio can become a fucking trafficy nightmare in the summertime, which is what happened. Um... So I want to apologize for that, but I'm I'm very I was very glad to be a part of the event. I was very honored to be a part of the event when Misty asked me to do it. I was very excited uh, to 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 be a part of it. So uh, I wanted to show you guys, you know, some of the speeches. Uh, I wanted to show you guys my set, and then later I will also put up just my set for those that just want to watch my my portion of it. Uh, I will put that up uh, a, a little later. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy the home run for Assange Columbus event. Uh, April 11th, 2019, Julian Assange was taken out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, this came about 12 hours after the International Monetary Fund released a loan of $4.2 billion uh, to the nation of Ecuador um, on behalf of the U.S. and the U.K. Shortly thereafter, Lenin Moreno illegally removed Julian Assange's citizenship and political asylum. British police stormed the embassy in a military fashion and removed Julian out of it. As he was coming out, he was holding a book and screaming. That's not ever the image I expected to see. And I feel like a lot of people feel that exact same way. Fast forward a little bit to January, February of 2020. Julian had spent almost a year in jail before his first actual trial had started. Not the evidentiary hearing of his extradition, but simply a week-long, hey, this is what's about to happen. Following that, in the end of March, Julian Assange was denied access to his lawyers for six months while in Belmarsh Prison until September of 2020 when the evidentiary hearing against him started. Six months without being able to speak with an attorney. Six months without being able to talk to your loved ones. Six months without being able to see your kids. Locked in a maximum security prison where the only means of communication with the outside is through a video monitor where you don't even know if the person that you're talking to is real. You have, he has no private conversations with his attorneys at all. Every conversation he has is videotaped, filmed, done through a, a computer monitor where he looks at his attorney through the other side. We found out that leading up to the arrest in April 2019 that there was this company called UC Global a global intelligence company, a private security firm, as they, as they name themselves, that was tasked with protecting the Ecuadorian government in, in uh, the, uh, the embassy in the UK. Sheldon Adelson, David Morales, they turned to the dark side, right? That's what David's emails say about UC Global. They started spying on Julian constantly, installing microphones as far as the women's bathroom. In a, in a feat of pure dystopia, Julian Assange brought out a white noise machine to interrupt and allow him to have privileged legal conversations um, with his attorneys. In response, the CIA and UC Global installed laser microphones on the windows. 
so that way they could listen in, even in the event that Julian brought out his white noise machine. I don't know, well, I, I do know what world we're living in, but I am a freaking ashamed that any government that takes money from me would install a laser microphone to get around a white noise machine that got around the microphones that were illegally installed in an embassy in the UK to spy on an Australian citizen that exposed the crimes of the American government. And I've spent the last 30 years of my life seeing absolutely no accountability. Um, you know, back in, at the beginning of January, um, Julian uh, won his extradition case. Uh, that was around the 3rd of January. Uh, and then he, he won on Hill's grounds and the, the judge there basically, you know, found that extraditing to the US would basically be a, uh, a sentence, uh, you know, a sentence to death. Uh, a few days later, the, the, the judge, you know, in a like, sort of, um, in a sick move, uh, refused his bail. So he, he was sent back to the maximum security prison at Belmarsh, uh, which is, you know, where they had the, the baddest, most violent prisoners in the UK. Um, and he was sent back there and, and it's been just over six months now since uh, since the US government signaled that they would appeal the extradition rejection and we still don't know whether whether the appeal will be held or when it will be held. So Julian has been sitting in, sitting in the Belmarsh prison, uh, you know, which has been COVID locked down. There's no, no visitors since October, so he hasn't been able to see his family, his lawyers um, for over six months. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just heartbreaking to see, um, you know, your loved one just locked in a, locked in a prison sort of indefinitely without, without any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of sentence or time, time when they can, can, can be released. When I did go and visit him in October, it, it, you know, it is, you, you do get a real sense that, you know, the, the other family members visiting, visiting their loved ones. I don't know if anyone's ever had a, had a, a relative in prison, but uh, usually they have a release date and, and you know, or, or, you know, parole or, or when they get good behavior or something like that. So, you know, they're always planning or looking forward to doing something or, you know, having a welcome home party or, you know, making, you know, what are we going to do for the future or, or things like that. But with us, with Julian, we can't, we can't actually uh, do any of that because uh, there, there is no, no real end in sight uh, for Julian. There's only one road to freedom, and that's knowledge. That's the only road to freedom. And as you see, the first speaker outline knowledgeably the circumstance of the oppression and intimidation of a, a journalist. Gabrielle put some warm family details into that circumstances that Julian's experienced these 12 years. That knowledge, the warmth and emotion of detail and the intellectual content of the first speaker brings freedom. You can see and feel within yourself that that freedom arrives immediately. You know the circumstances. You know what states are involved, the Swedish, the UK. I'm not, I'll change that. You know what states are involved, the Swedish prosecuting authority, the Crown, UK Crown Prosecuting Service, and the Department of Justice in the United States. When it was decided to drag Julian out of the embassy, the 12 senators wrote to Marino, Lennon Marino, he was the president of Ecuador. They wrote to him and said, uh, this is not good what you're doing. Then Mike Pence went down and had a chat with him. Mike Pence is a Christian evangelical, um, as is uh, Pompeo. The organizing group uh, uh, of the attempt to extradite Julian Assange under the 1917 Espionage Act was organised by those people. Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, and a man named William Barr. William Barr, under the Bush the first, had a nickname 
to snatch it because he was capable, determined, and willing to use the extradition treaties of the United States to kidnap judicially from around the world anybody that they wanted to bring to the United States for either political reasons, reasons of control of money, or technological reasons. That's, for example, Ming Wen Zhu of uh, Huawei, who's been judicially kidnapped in Canada and attempt to extradite to the United States because Huawei has uh, technology that uh, certain people in the United States want. The Council of Europe came into being, which is solely concerns itself with the human rights and human rights legislation is embedded in every nation in Europe as a member of the Council of Europe, that's 44 nations. For some reason or other, in 2001, the United States Empire decided that those glorious cultural artifacts that were put together under the terrible experience of 80 million dead and most of the world destroyed in a world war, decided for reasons we can't understand, they won't reveal, you can speculate on, that all of these artifacts of culture created in the 20th century had to be abandoned in the 21st century and progressively they've done so. With the United Nations ruled by laws which allows nations to put their self-interest forward and negotiate as a solution, they brought up something like what is called rules-based. You might remember Mad Magazine from the 60s. It had a comic strip in it uh, monthly. I rule, okay. You rule, okay. No rules, okay. It's sort of comic, sort of infantile. And so it goes. The great symbol, the icon, that tragedy of abandoning these golden means, these wonderful artifacts of culture. The, the icon of that is the treatment of Julian Assange. Not one of the conventions of asylum was obeyed in, by the United Kingdom in the arbitrary detention of Julian Assange. Not one. And they're signatories. In fact, more than signatories, they're part of the authorship of the Conventions on Asylum. Not one. Procedural irregularities in Julian Assange's case are like a Niagara. They're just continuous. It's just a display of malice towards somebody who took seriously the great artifact of the United States as beginning the First Amendment. He took it seriously and brought to us the knowledge of how to understand, how to measure, and how to ask our governments what, what they're doing in our name. And not only that, how to intelligently participate in the creation of policies that suit us and make getting on with our neighbouring states easier and fruitful. What was the decision? No, no extradition. extradition. What was the decision? No, no extradition. extradition. So right now, though, this fight isn't just for Julian's freedom. He's not the only person in being prosecuted by the State Department for revealing factual and accurate information. Um, my friends and I do a show that we call the Free Assange Vigil. Some may have seen it, some may have not. Um, every show we open with what we call the numbers. Um, and it's going through the amount of days that have passed and significant events have happened in regards to whistleblowing and journalism. Um, so let me get those pulled up here because I want to run them through here with you. Some of them are disturbing. Some of them are hopeful. Um, some of them just flat out don't make sense. Um, so I'm going to read through here. Um, my numbers may not be completely accurate, um, but we try our absolute best to, to redo them about every two weeks just to make sure they're right. Um, we have 3,839 days of illegal and arbitrary detention for Julian Assange. 
Uh, we have 100 or 802 days since the WikiLeaks founder was trafficked from the Ecuadorian embassy after being sold to the U.S. and U.K. for a $4.2 billion loan to Lenin Moreno's Ecuadorian government. We have 165 days since Vanessa Bratzer's January 6, 2021 ruling denying Julian Assange bail and forcing him, in, forcing him to stay in prison after citing fairness to the United States which came two days after that judge personally wrote in her declaration, I order the release of Julian Paul Assange. Little Wayne. Right. <laughs> uh, we have uh, 700, or I'm sorry, we have at this point, one day free almost for reality winner. Um, I don't know if everyone knows who she is or what she does, uh, but she was a whistleblower for the NSA that exposed the absolute incompetence of the intelligence community to the point that they couldn't even identify the source of an email. She has spent the last, where is it, 1,464 days in federal incarceration. But I am happy to announce, just as Gabriel did, that today is the first day that she is being moved to a halfway house in preparation for her November 3rd, 2021 release. 23rd. November 23rd, 2021 release. We have 3,000, 1,394 days of inhumane detention for the unproven alleged Vault 7 whistleblower, Joshua Schultz. This is a really important moment us in history. Um, I say it all the time on our show um, that we've been doing for two years that we're really at a crossroads in the United States of America. We're going to go one of two ways. Um, and Julian Assange has been made the example. Um, he's been made kind of the boiling point. Uh, and what WikiLeaks gives us is an invaluable service. It's not conjecture. It's not some overpaid head in a suit giving you his opinion. It's pristine, authenticated, verifiable source documentation. Um, exposing corruption and criminality of uh, 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 governments across the globe and corporations across the globe. That's an invaluable service to humanity. Um, the things that they have exposed are some of the most heinous and vicious crimes that we've ever seen. Um, and if that's what's been exposed, imagine what we don't know about. Uh, you know, that where there's one rat, there's a hundred. That, that's really what we're looking at here. Um, and so they're using Julian Assange as the example. They want to make an example out of him. It's not even about Julian. Um, yes, they want to shut him up. Yes, they want to make him go away. But this is about silencing all of us. All of us. You, you, me, all of us. This is coming for all of us. And he's just being used as the example to make everybody afraid to speak out against the U.S. empire, against Western empire. Um, and we have to fight back against that. We're running out of time. If Julian Assange is allowed to be extradited, he's allowed to be brought to the United States, it's over. We can't... The, how do you come back from that once you lose this is your first amendment this is not a game this is your first amendment and once that's gone it's gone think about how hard fought that was just to get it the first time do you really think we're going to be able to get it the second time because i don't i don't and so we are and we're holding on to it by a thread it is just barely there as it is we have a protest law anti-protest laws across the country cropping up um, you know, something like 30 of them have already passed. There are 70 on the books in states across the country. We have four right now in the state of Ohio that we have to fight against. And that is what they're coming for. They don't want to say, they don't want you to speak out against them. They don't want their crimes exposed. They want to be able to do all of those things in silence and in the dark. And we cannot allow that to happen. Again, look at the things that have been exposed that we know that has happened. I don't want those kind of people to be able to do that under the cloak of darkness. They need to be exposed every day, all day. People in power should be terrified to step out of line. They should be afraid to do anything wrong. We should have complete privacy. They should have none. And it's the ba it's backwards. It's backwards. They have complete privacy and you have none. They know what you eat. They know where you go to school. They know where your kids go to school, what store you shop at, what size shoe you wear. They know everything about you. And that needs to be flipped. We need to flip that immediately. People in power should have no privacy, none, zero, zip. You don't get any. Once you put yourself into a position of power, that's what you should be signing up for, period. We also must ask ourselves why this is happening. Why are we keeping this case in the dark? Why has the media largely remained silent? Fortunately, because of groups like Action for Assange and other grassroots journalists, more and more people in the mainstream media, in New York Times, 
the Wall Street Journal, among other publications, are stepping up and they're speaking out and saying enough is enough. This is wrong. This is an attack on all journalists. So it's not just a fringe group of activists anymore. That is not at all the case. Every single major civil liberties organization in the United States and throughout the world is calling for Julian Assange to be freed and for this case to be dropped. journalism that won Julian Assange numerous awards is the same journalism that has him in a prison today. He is in one of the worst prisons, if not the worst prison in England right now. And I want to reiterate right now, especially to the Biden administration, that, every, that each day that Julian Assange is sitting in Belmarsh prison, and each day that the United States, this country, continues to prosecute this, this case, is another day that the United States betrays its own constitution. How can we allow this? Does this make any sense? No, it doesn't, right? And lastly, at the end of the second half of the extradition proceedings, I spoke with Lori Love, who was one of the very few people who can understand what Julian Assange is going through as far as facing extradition to the United States. And Lori Love said something to me that was very profound. He said that oftentimes it is the punish the process can be the punishment. This process is a punishment, and we're seeing that happen right now, especially with the judge's latest decision back earlier in winter where she denied his bail. Absolutely devastating decision, but one thing that we all have to remember is that, oh, I want to end off, first of all, with a message from Edward Snowden. I said this a few months ago, but I think it's really important to keep remembering this. And I think all of us here who are activists and journalists, especially independent journalists, know this, but we cannot rely on elected leaders to solve our problems. And while I am going to call upon the Biden administration to separate itself from Trump era attacks on the free press by dropping this case and freeing Assange, we must all depend on each other as well. Because real change begins with me, it begins with all of you here, it begins with the organizers of this event, it begins with everyone who is fighting for this case and who cares about the future of the free press. Another thing too here is that this is not just a, a broader press issue or First Amendment issue. This is someone's life and I think that's why it's important to have these events, to have Julian Assange's family here. So we know this is a real person who is being impacted by this. Niels Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, said that he has been subjected to torture for a decade. This is completely unacceptable and the UK government, the US, Ecuador and Sweden have not been held accountable for this. Julian Assange ought to be freed and he also ought to be compensated for this horrific, for the horrific state crimes that have been leveled against him. If we constantly raise awareness and collectively act together like we are today, we can impact Julian Assange's tomorrow. We can save free speech and free press around the world, and we can save the life of Julian Assange. Thank you. Uh, and I want to start by saying that uh, after two decades of living in this country, at the end of 2019, uh, I officially became a naturalized citizen of the United States. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to vote against my own interests. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a dream for every immigrant in this country. I have, uh, I have realized that in this country, though, uh, a lot of people don't understand what their rights are, what, their, what the Constitution actually stands for, right? And I think one of the reasons is why we're here today is is to fight for Julian Assange, just to be his voice when he has been ours for so long, right? I think I think a lot of people don't know what Ju what Julian has actually been going through. Uh, before he was illegally to, uh, imprisoned in Belmarsh Prison, he was in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years. And, uh, and a lot of the rhetoric that was surrounding that is, well, he's freeloading at the Ecuadorian embassy. He's freeloading, you guys. Not being imprisoned in America. He's freeloading over there. Which is ridiculous. And being in asylum shouldn't be a prison sentence with Wi-Fi. That shouldn't be the case, right? It should, you should be celebrated for revealing war crimes. You should be celebrated for being a real journalist. But in America, that's not the case. They, they claim that he was freeloading. Well, I guess if that's the case, then the story of Rapunzel is just about a hot lady that's been freeloading off her parents 
giving her a free tower and socialized haircuts, right? That's or maybe the prisoners over at Guantanamo Bay are just freeloading, suckling at the teeth of the freedoms of the American torture program. That's probably what they're doing, right? I think it's important to know what Julian Assange really revealed about America. I think the most famous thing that he revealed was the collateral murder video, right? I think a lot of us here have seen it. If you haven't, uh, it is proof that the American military killed Iraqi civilians and two routers journalists indiscriminately, yeah, making jokes along the way. Yeah, I think that pretty much proves that the, the policy that America has on the First Amendment is shoot the messenger. Yeah. Quite literally, yeah. that is the policy that we have in America. I don't think Americans really understand what journalism is. We have a very odd relationship with journalism in this country, right? To most Americans, I think journalism is two pundits on the opposite side of the screen screaming at each other about, I don't know, whatever topic you want to choose, and Tucker Carlson desperately trying to gain control of his show again and hoping nobody drops the end bomb, right? Like, fingers <laughs> crossed. It's either that or they scream about Russia for about three and a half hours, uh, day in and day out, and that's what American journalism is supposed to be. But it's not. Real journalism, true journalism, is about fighting back against power. It's about telling the truth, about holding people in a position of power far more accountable than corporate journalism ever would. And that's what Julian Assange did. The collateral murder video is proof of that. And where does that put him? That puts him in prison. Not one person from the collateral murder video is in prison. All right. Uh, so there you have it. That is uh, that is some of the, the the snippets of some of the speeches and, um, <clears throat> and what, what coverage of the event uh, big, big thanks to Misty Winston, Andrew, uh, Taylor, everybody at Axon for Assange, John Shipton and Gabriel Shipton for, for coming over and, and, and spreading the word about what's going on with Julian so that more people can get on board. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, you know, Julian Assange has been our voice for a very long time and, and now it's our turn to be his voice, uh, so that he can be free. Uh, which is which is what he should be. He is Ill being illegally imprisoned at this moment. Um, but I I I felt eh, you know, but I felt okay about my set to be honest. Uh, which I tend to do. I think everybody is their own worst critic, right? Um, but I missed a couple of the couple of jokes that I wanted to tell because when I got there, um, I I started recording and. Uh, Andrew started introducing the next performer or, or next speaker, I should say, performer. Used to used to the, the stand-up context of things, I suppose. Um, but he was introducing the next speaker, and I didn't realize that it was going to be me. Um, because in my head, I thought everything was going to, like, all the speakers would start a little bit later. Uh, but they pretty, pretty much started on time. Uh, and, you know... Um, that's which is part of the reason I felt terrible, uh, but I felt okay about my set. I, I missed a couple of jokes. Uh, I did a shorter set than I intended because I got to a point where I was like, "Okay, I'm about to start repeating myself because I can't remember some of these jokes uh, or some of the directions I wanted to go." Um, so I I decided instead of just re rehashing some of the same statements I made, I will thank everybody and and move on. Um, and then Andrew gave a, a, a very rousing speech at the end. So uh, that that's what I'm going to close this video on is, is Andrew's speech. Um, but I did get to hang out with, with Andrew, which I, uh, I, I haven't done in, in quite some time. I think the last time I saw him was when I did a show in Columbus with Lee Camp. Um, and uh, this was the first time I got to hang out with Misty Winston in person. That was very cool. Uh, and then I got to talk to Gabriel and John Shipton for a few minutes, and uh, and I thanked John for for m m John Mr. Shipton for for coming to the states and and doing this tour, and uh, he he said that he he enjoyed my set and that he liked the the, the message that I had uh, a, a, in my in my comedy and and that my comedy was a hoot, which I think is like fucking amazing that he said that like i'm i'm gonna put that on all my posters <laughs> john shipton grish is a hoot <laughs> uh 
one of my friends, uh, Emma, who who does uh, a lot of great photojournalism, um, and has uh, been on the forefront of covering a lot of the BLM protests and things of that sort. Uh, work with Mid Press News. She's fantastic. Uh, Emma suggested that somebody should draw a cartoon owl of me, uh, and underneath it, it says he's a hoot, and put it on a T-shirt. Misty said she'd make buttons, and uh, if somebody wants to make that happen, that is probably one of the best T-shirt ideas I've heard in in quite some time. Um, but overall, you know, I I, I felt pretty terrible, and I'm going to probably feel terrible about being late. Uh, to the event, um, but you know, overall it was it was great. I got to meet some new people, see some see some old friends that I haven't seen in quite some time. Hang out with Andrew and Misty and Shane, and um, that was very cool. Uh, hopefully, you know, I will be returning to Columbus to Cleveland uh, to do a tour. Um, you know, we we talked about doing like a bigger kind of comedy for Assange event, which would be. Um, which would be amazing. Uh, and Andrew talked to me about trying to do more in this region in terms of uh, activism and organi or organizing, which, you know, I don't particularly have the skill or the um, energy or, 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 like, my brain doesn't work in that, in that regard. Like, I put together shows all the time, um, but organizing, like, an event like this with speakers and, um, you know, flyering and marches and things of that sort. Uh, that's a little bit harder to do. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just, it's not something that I would particularly be very good at, I think. Uh, but, you know, if, if they do more in, in, the, in the Ohio, West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania region, I will gladly be there to help. I will gladly be there to promote and amplify it and go down there to cover it. And, you know, if, 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 if there's room to, to perform again, I would, I would very much do that as well. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we do more of this sort of stuff. Um, I know on July 3rd, uh, is Julian Assange's birthday and the, they've encouraged people to, you know, uh, kind of, find a 4th of July event and and pseudo take over it. Uh, just have a portion where you can talk to Assange with people. So if there's something like that happening in your town, in your city somewhere, you know, g get a few folks together. And I'm sure Misty and Andrew will help organize something or, or give you tips on how to organize something like this. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of... That's sort of what my mindset is on that is is I would love to be the person that tries to amplify it that that was kind of the role that I think um people like myself play in in this thing so uh which is which is like yeah we all kind of need each other but uh I was very honored to be a part of this event I was very excited to 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 go to go go back out on the road for a bit you know and 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 do some stand-up uh, for, for, for a pretty cool crowd. Uh, plus I got to make fun of Mike Pompeo in front of a government building, which I, that's, that's a win in my book. Uh, so yeah. And, and, uh, you guys are all awesome. I would, I would love to do this more. I would love to be able to cover, um, direct action a little bit more do, you know, in, in, in a comedy journalism kind of way. And, um, you know, I, I have a statement of transparency up on my website that talks about all of the things I would like to do if, if I can get the particular funds to do it, right? Like what I would, how much I would need um, on a monthly basis to do all of the things I want to do full time, to do content creator, content creation, touring, and comedy journalism all at the same time. Um, so those are kind of the goals that I have. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if that is something that you would like to see more of, uh, and you enjoy my content, then, you know, I, and you're on stable financial ground, <clears throat> I would encourage you guys to go to my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com and, uh, and become a sustaining member, um, or make a one-time donation. Every little bit helps uh, helps this, this, this channel grow and helps me do more of what I want to do and helps me uh, cover stories and cover direct action that corporate mainstream media uh, is not going to cover. 
Um, so yeah, and without any further ado, I I would I, I want to wrap this uh, video up with uh, with with Andrew's closing statements. So enjoy. Thank you. We have libertarians and Green Party members represented hey, here today. Billboard. This billboard. billboard. Thank you, billboard. It'll change in a minute. <laughs> There's a this billboard. This fight there. does not have a slant. There's no leftism or rightism here. There's no Democrat, Republican, socialist, capitalist, anything. Right or wrong. Right. It is right or wrong. It is. This is the start of the battle of good versus evil. This is the, the St. Patrick's Battalion of the United States standing up for free peoples that are being imprisoned around the world. A lot of the things that we talk about as activists, um, we don't even realize that WikiLeaks helped us expose. We wouldn't know about the war in Yemen if it hadn't been for WikiLeaks. Just flat out, we wouldn't have known what was going on in Yemen if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. Right? We wouldn't have known about the largest chemical spill in world history off the coast of Africa if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. We wouldn't know what's happening in what was happening inside of the Democratic Party in 2016 if it hadn't been for WikiLeaks. Right? So as, as we leave here and depart, just remember to ask yourself, whenever a global situation happens, right, whenever there's something that the mainstream media is trying to tell you is real what would wikileaks show who would wikileaks reveal as the people behind the scenes manipulating the strings of power right because the one thing that we are at now is having the democrats realize that democrats rig elections and now republicans realize that republicans rig elections or that Democrats rig elections. If you were someone that was involved in the Ron Paul era of conservative organizing, you understand that Republicans rig elections, right? We don't have anything that resembles what we're told we have in this country. We do not have democracy. We do not have a free press. We do not have the ability to expose and hold accountable people that commit crimes against humanity. People starving nations, killing innocents and claiming that their enemy combatants still walk free, still go on primetime television, while the person that sacrificed literally his life, everything for the last decade, if not longer, is in jail for that. There was a young woman, Chelsea Manning, spent, at this point, her entire adult life in and out of prison. In 2020, she was finally released, hopefully for good, after a suicide attempt. Because of how heinous ADX Florence is, how heinous the Eastern District of Virginia and the Manhattan prison systems are. So I don't agree with the ruling by the UK in Julian's court case. Because the United States does not have international jurisdiction over press. The United States does not get to make a determine, determination of who and who isn't a journalist. Right? But the biggest thing is that the United States doesn't get to do this uncontested. They have a bunch of rowdy free people that will go down swinging saying this is wrong. Right? So I've personally taken it upon myself that if they're going to drag me out of my house for knowing factual and accurate information and sharing it on social media, I'll make myself available. I'll show up in the streets. I'll put myself on camera in the same room every day in a small warehouse in Cleveland because I'm not going down without a fight. And if it ends up that any single one of us get put into prison for revealing factual and accurate information, it means we're winning because we are the little guys. The fact that we are here today means that the empire has no clothes. It means that it is collapsing around us at a monumental rate that we probably can't even fathom. So as the free thinking people of the world, what we have to prepare for is what comes next. There was a woman by the name of Susie Dawson um, who very early on encouraged me to do what I'm doing now. But the question she always had whenever we were talking about organizing was what will you do once Julian is free? Right, so 
that question kind of turned into like a philosophical sort of thing. Because you hear this idea of the chilling effect all the way back um, to the prosecution of Daniel Ellsberg, how going after a whistleblower or a source or a journalist makes others scared to do the same thing. But I would like to leave everyone with this notion today of the boiling effect, right? Because the U.S. is not going to win this court case, even if it takes a decade to get Julian free. They will not win. And what will our world be when the Mike Pompeo's, John Bolton's, and Merrick Garland's of the world are forced to admit that you can expose classified information and you can expose criminals because the next step after that is accountability and we are almost there so please do not leave today with your heads hung low please know that just by showing up just by making a scene for these people inside of this larger than life building you are making a difference because every time we organize every time we have a conversation with someone about this. We change the world. There's a, a little thingy over there, a little monument on the other side of the park that I'd like everyone to look at. And it says, if you save one life, you have saved the world. So I just want everyone to kind of reflect on that because that's what we're fighting to do. It may be one man that has brought us all here together today. But it is the ideas that he stood for, for why it is important. So I would just like to, again, thank everyone. And if we can give the Shiftons one more round of applause, that would be amazing.